Okay. Welcome back. Let's pray together. Father God, since uh, we last met a week ago, you have watched over us. You have forgiven our sins in Jesus Christ. You have given us willing hearts each morning to serve you and to love you and to and you've given us the energy and the strength that we've needed to complete the tasks that you've had for us to do. And all of that, Father, we've been dependent upon you and your fatherly care and provision for us. We thank you for that. We thank you too that uh, <clears throat> in the Lord Jesus Christ we has a, have a sufficient Saviour who forgives our sins every day without measure, without restraint and uh, without compulsion. We thank you, Father, that you are a great and a mighty God and you know our lives from beginning to end. You sovereignly foreordain whatsoever comes to pass and we have that confidence, even as we are here tonight, that the whole of our lives are in your hands and nothing catches you by surprise and we can trust you and confidently place all of our lives with you. We thank you for your promises in Jesus Christ. We thank you that having believed, we have been sealed with the Holy Spirit guaranteeing our inheritance. Father, we just commit our hearts to you this evening and as we look at this material and consider how we can help and minister to people going through difficult situations in their lives, we pray that you would help us examine our own hearts and we might better understand the hearts of others and know how to minister the graces of Christ in more effective ways. We pray you'd watch over our families in our absence and, and keep their hearts close to you. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, uh, last week we looked at transition and this week we're looking at crisis. So our, uh, our overall concept for this course is that all of us go through transitions in life. Some of those transitions are inevitable as we go from, from infancy to childhood to adolescence to uh, young adult to middle adult to um, uh, old age, old, old age and death. Now, these transitions are inevitable, we have to make them, and often at the crossover, there, is, uh, there can be a crisis. So when you're working with people in a pastoral care situation, uh, you can be asking yourself, hmm, what transition have they recently come through? What transition are they about to go through? And ask yourself, I wonder if there's any, uh, been any crisis for them in their pro previous transition, the most recent one. I wonder what crises they will anticipate in the next one. Those are the natural crises. And then there's the, uh, the other transitions that people go through that have been forced upon them that aren't common to everybody. People might experience a job loss, a health crisis, uh, the death of a child. Um, and, and they have to transition from uh, through that loss and, th and, and through that they would experience a crisis. So transition is inevitable. Crisis is not inevitable, but for many of us, crisis is a reality of life in a fallen world. Well, last week we looked at transition generally uh, as an introduction. Tonight we're going to look at crisis, and uh, then we're going to move through the course into and begin looking at these different stages. Uh, this, this term, two lectures on con con uh, conception and inf infancy, early childhood, middle childhood, adolescence. Now, you've, uh, <clears throat> last week we went over the course requirements and uh, uh, gave you your reading assignments. Have there been any uh, questions or concerns about that as you've thought about that and reflected? I hope it hasn't spoiled your week. Um, Uh, Michelle, I handed this out last week too, that um, 
some book recommendations for that term paper. Okay, so how's your reading in Burger this week? Peachy? Alright, Mark? Great. Oh, great. Great. You'll all fall in love with Burger before the end of the week, end of the year. Okay, crisis. Here's a definition of a crisis. A situation which challenges the adequacy of a person's view of themselves and of God. <coughs> We might be feeling quite adequate with our lives and our relationship with God and then we hit a transition and often we hit a, we're not expecting a crisis when we hit that transition and now we wonder if we're adequate. For instance, here's a, uh, uh, here's a mother about to send her uh, firstborn off to school for the very first time or here's a, uh, an older mother saying goodbye to her youngest child who's leaving home. That's a transition obviously for the child. But it's also a transition for the mother. Now, the mother may not be expecting a crisis. She may not be expecting this to be uh, traumatic for her. And sometimes it can come as quite a surprise. And she finds herself saying, I didn't think it would affect me so much. I thought I could handle this. I've had, you know, my other children have left home. And this was the last one. And just kind of the next one on the line. And, but suddenly, you see, she, she's, she's faced with an unexpected inadequacy to handle a different situation uh, in her own heart and relationship with God. And it surprises her, catches her off balance. So it's a situation which challenges the adequacy of a person's view of themselves and of God. Now, we shouldn't assume that everyone who goes through a transition will have a crisis. So you're talking to someone after church at cup of tea and you know that their, um, their firstborn has just started school or their lastborn has just left home and you might say something, um, Oh, well, I hear Johnny left home this week. That must be really hard on you. You see, you're assuming that there's a crisis in that transition. Better to let them say. Better to say, um, what's that like for you? And, and invite them to talk about what effect it may be having on them. So let's not assume that it's a crisis every time. A crisis happens when the day-to-day -day movement of life is disrupted. And... Uh, <clears throat> If we're looking at the mega crises, these uh, moments can range from mild and soon forgotten to intense life-changing experiences. So going from the mega to the minor, earthquake, tsunami, hurricane, tornado, fire, war, rape, mugging, an affair, a divorce, a cancer diagnosis, a loss of wallet, keys or credit card. Uh, each one of them could produce a crisis. Now you every one of us has suddenly misplaced our keys as we're about to walk out the door to an important meeting we don't want to be late for. And there's a little bit of a panic sets in because if we can't find the keys, we can't start the car. If we can't start the car, we don't get there. And suddenly, you kind of, you know, you go into that freeze mode. Now, and, and so um, your spouse very helpfully, very helpfully says, well, where were you when you last had them? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was right here. I had them right here on the table. Well, it's a little crisis, you see, and, and how you handle that crisis with yourself and with those around you gives a huge insight into where your heart's at. You know, can you handle these things with a, with a confidence that God is in control, or do you find yourself panicking? Do you find yourself giving the people around you a hard time? Do you blame them for the fact that you find yourself in a crisis, in a sense of inadequacy that you didn't see coming, that kind of caught you unawares? What does James say? Count it or joy, or pure joy when you enter trials of many kinds. Well, that's what we're talking about here, trials of many kinds. Well, these crises, uh, people who have done research on these things have divided these crises into situational, developmental, and transitional. A situational crisis uh, can be an acute a situation, like a divorce, that's an acute, it's kind of, it just happens, it's huge, it's situational and it happens and uh, once it happens it can take, uh, it can produce trauma or crisis. So it can be acute or it can be a chronic uh, situational crisis like a deteriorating mental condition or a chronic illness. Uh, somebody would say with chronic pain would be experiencing a situational crisis which is ongoing. Uh, so there's the short, sharp one, which is you kind of get over and move on with your life, or there's the chronic one. 
Uh, it might be that you have a, um, a child with a disability. Well, that would be, for you, it could be a chronic crisis, something that your, uh, your um, having to face every day. I was talking to a woman once whose, whose son was, um, her adopted son was born with alcohol fetal syndrome. At the time she adopted the boy, she didn't really understand all the implications of that. Uh, but as the boy grew up, it was evident that he just wasn't going to be able to handle life the way his parents would have liked him to have handled it. And she said to me, it's like being given a life sentence. Well, she was facing a chronic situational crisis, one that was ongoing, uh, one which it was evident this boy would never be able to leave home and live independently, and he was uh, he he acted very um, um, without any regard, without any sense of responsibility, without any real understanding of right and wrong. That's a situational crisis, a developmental crisis. Uh, occurs at the milestones of life and growth. First day of school, last child leaves home, retirement. Uh, that's um, uh, <coughs> so that's a bit like these ones up here, developmental. And the transitional is moving through one lifespan and on to the next, through school grades, adolescence, courtship, marriage, childbirth, job, promotion or demotion, old age. Now as you can see, there's some overlap there as you, as we try to draw these circles and as we try to define crises, you know, situational, transitional, developmental, you see there's a bit of overlap there and you could, some of these crises could fit in more than one category. But it's an attempt to try to separate them out so we can think about how you might treat one crisis as differently from another. Would you approach, if you are counselling or in pastoral care situation, would you approach a situational crisis different from a transitional crisis? or a developmental crisis. Well, maybe you would. A situational crisis is obviously one that is often one you don't expect, uh, one you don't see coming. Situational or transitional crises can be anticipated. That could be one difference. Uh, most people recover from their crises but in some cases the effect can continue for some time. And uh, uh, battle fatigue or shell shock in wartime is an example. Another one is uh, uh, battered wife syndrome. W you know what that's like where, where the woman has been in that situation for so long that, um, the, uh, <coughs> that she, uh, she's unable to kind of stand back from it and talk about it and, and speak to it and tell the story about it and uh, uh, receive counsel. The, the crisis has, um, because it's gone on for so long, and it's, it's not something that she's ever had the chance to recover from, she's never been given space in her life where she can recover from uh, the crisis, say the situational crisis of domestic violence or domestic abuse, she hasn't been able to have the time out to recover from that. It's just so uh, being in that crisis constantly and ongoing has re has removed her ability to be able to deal with it and speak to it, and um, uh, it feels to her like a huge loss of power uh, to be able to um, take responsibility for her own life. Another. Um, crisis which a person may never fully recover from is uh, a loss they a loss they endure from a sudden or unexpected death this is very common for instance when a parent loses a child and um, you know uh, uh, as we understand with with grief there's that initial period of of incredible grief and then you know you kind of uh, uh, begin to subside, the waves of grief subside, but you see there's, there's a sense in which they can never move past that and get on with their life as it were. For the rest of their life there'll be, there'll be times when something will trigger the grief and the grief will come back, maybe just for a short period of time. It, it might be just come totally unawares, they might see something or hear something even fleeting and it just uh, brings them again up short with the grief. They might see um, 
somebody, uh, a young person having a birthday who would, who would have been the same age as their child that they lost. So, you see, it's, it's ongoing. Um, a major crisis may take many years to recover from. Reactions to a crisis or a traumatic event in most cases follows a predictable path to recovery. So people have done a lot of study in crisis and trauma situations and they've, they've kind of seen these stages which I've caught here in immediate um, confusion, adjustment and reconstruction. Now these steps won't be there every time with a crisis um, uh, but some of them may well be there and uh, certainly a person's uh, relationship with Christ, the nearness, the, the strength of their Christian faith may well have a determining factor on how they go through this path to recovering. Well first there's the immediate impact, a numbness, a disorientation, a disbelief, a limited insight. I was just reading I was just reading this afternoon about the, um, the little 10-year-old uh, boy that was shot up there on the east coast on that uh, isolated farm where he was going hunting with his uncle and his cousin. And uh, we still don't know what happened, but the gun went off and the boy was killed. And I was reading about the mother's reaction to it. She was talking about what that was like. And uh, <clears throat> when she first heard the news, uh, the boy's uncle, it was her brother, uh, called up um, called up her mother, she was staying in her mother's house, called up the mother and said, um, um, Billy I think his name was, oh, Billy is dead, he's, he's died of a gunshot wound. And then the mother had to turn around, the, the grandmother turned around and then tell the mother that her son was dead. And, and the mother said that when I heard it, the first thing I did was scream and then uh, it was just um, disbelief. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that he was gone and I had to wait until it was confirmed by the police. And then she talked about her, uh, her disorientation, how she deals with that. She talked about how she, um, it's, been, uh, it's been about three or four weeks now, and she still goes to the child's picture about three or four times a day and talks to the picture and uh, she says things like, you know, Billy talks to me and tells me that I have to forgive and that you know, so she's, she's kind of doing this um, self-therapy with the memory of her child. So numbness, disorientation, disbelief, limited insight. And then that's followed by um, a confused, uh, confused withdrawal. You kind of withdraw back into yourself. This is typical and it's temporary and it includes exhaustion and discomfort plus intense emotional experience of guilt, anxiety, depression, sadness, anger, rage, insecurity, indecision, inefficiency, bewilderment, impassiveness, desperation, apathy, helplessness, a sense of urgency. Now not all of those necessarily would be evident, uh, but you see uh, just again this mother, her, her uh, withdrawing back into the relationship with her dead child and speaking to her dead child three or four times a day to the picture, you see it's a it's a way of her trying to deal with the intensity of the emotional experience of having lost that child. Uh, so she actually uh, testified to a feeling of guilt that she'd let the child go. She talked about her anger against, the, uh, against her brother and uh, about her um, impassiveness. She just couldn't do anything. She was, it kind of immobilized her. Now that uh, it's typical and it's temporary, but it may continue on for a while. So if you're if you're talking to someone or counselling someone or just sharing your heart or your life with someone who's gone through an experience like this, w we can expect those kinds of emotions. Now it's very important that we uh, we maintain a non-anxious presence in the face of of these uh, clusters of emotions this person's experiencing. We know that it's temporary. These emotions are temporary. They're a natural reaction to life in a fallen world where, where bad things happen and we're powerless to stop them. And we're powerless to stop the emotional pain that comes. And so here's a, as an instinctive reaction. So as we bear with those responses, you see, it's, we're not going to tell the person they shouldn't be feeling like that. 
We're not going to tell them they shouldn't be acting like that. We're just going to bear with them. It's important that they know that they're not alone, that they know that there is someone that they can, um, that can be with them in their life. Uh, the um, a pastor told me once of a situation where uh, someone in his church lost a child in a sudden death and he went round there to their house and as he heard and the parents were sitting there in kind of a numbness and shock and disbelief uh, and uh, this was in, within a, an hour or so of the child's death and the pastor told me that um, he just sat there for the rest of the day, just sat in the room with him, he didn't say anything, he just sat there. Um, and sometimes they talked, sometimes they didn't, sometimes they cried, sometimes they didn't, sometimes they left the room for a while and they came back again, but he just stayed there. He, he maintained a non-anxious presence, he didn't try to uh, have an intervention in their lives at this point, uh, he knew that this confused withdrawal that they were going through is something that is typical, but it's also temporary. And now, as you can imagine, it was some months later, they were able to say to the pastor that that was the, uh, that was the most helpful thing anybody did during that time, was what he did, just coming and sitting there, just being a presence there, without requiring anything from them, and without feeling within himself the need to do something or say something, maintain that non-anxious presence. Well, this, uh, this period then of confused withdrawal can then be followed by uh, an adjustment period where the seeker, that's the one who's seeking help from you, begins to adjust to their new reality. They begin climbing out of their confusion and begin to gain new hope. They are able to learn from their experience. Now, at this point, they're able to tell stories about what happened. They're able to look back and say, well, this is what happened and this is what it was like. Um, I don't know if any of you saw Campbell Live last night where he interviewed um, uh, the mother of the Kahui twins. What's her name? Maxine, Maxine King. As you know, uh, Chris Kahui was, um, the, the coroner's report came out, which laid the blame with Chris Kahui. So Campbell was interviewing with, uh, with the mother, with Maxine, and she was... Uh, it's been um, two or three years now since the twins died, so she's in this period of adjustment. And it was very interesting as she talked, she was um, uh, reliving the grief, and there were a lot of tears. And uh, but she was able to talk about it as not only what happened, she was able to talk about the effect on her at the time. She was able to talk what's happened between then and now, and she was able to talk about where she is now. And as you can imagine, the coroner's report has kind of re-traumatised her, has taken her right back there, but it hasn't taken her back there in a way that it was at the time that it happened. She, she's able, because there's been a period of adjustment, she's able to go back there now and talk about it. She's able to reconnect with her emotions and, um, and come to terms with them to some extent. Now, I would imagine this, uh, this um, woman whose boy was shot up on the East Coast, I would imagine that her going to this boy's picture two or three times a day and talking to him, that that too was, is going to be temporary, and uh, that eventually her new reality will begin to become her everyday reality, and she might find herself talking to her boy less and less. Uh, she might find herself more able to talk to other people rather than to the boy. You see how that works? We just give them time without abandoning them. Give them time but staying involved. So from the adjustment period, um, now see it's important to realize here that the adjustment period is not where you, uh, you, you readjust and, 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 and it's almost like you go back to what it was like before the event. It's not a readjustment back to the way things were, nor is it a readjustment that leaves it behind and you move on. It's, a it's an adjustment that says, 
what happened back here in the past is now part of my present reality and I'm living with this and adjusting my day-to-day -day living around this present reality that, that was occasioned by this event. It's that kind of an adjustment. It's not a, a moving on and leaving it behind. And then there's a reconstruction with clarity and confidence, new attachments and goals and renewed ministry where they engage with life and people again uh, with a renewed confidence uh, and, and they bring into those relationships and those new attachments and renewed ministry, they bring into that the experience and the lessons learned from the trauma, uh, the things that God has taught them if they're believers. Uh, perhaps, perhaps they can testify to a renewed trust in God a renewed, uh, uh, um, a growing faith in him and confidence in him to trust him. Often you'll sit, you'll hear people who've gone through a trauma like this say things like, um, "I feel much ready. I'm much more able now to counsel people who've been through similar experiences." Say if they've if they've lost a child, for instance. They you'll, when they get to this stage, you'll hear them say things like, um, "You know, I feel able to talk to someone who's lost a child because I've been through a similar experience." That sort of thing. See, they're coming to terms with it, and uh, if you like, they're, they're, they're building their life around, around this new reality. Okay, any, any comments or questions about any of that? Or anything you'd like to share from your experience or the experience of people you know who have been through a crisis? Any of the things we've said there kind of uh, ring true for you and the experience you've had with yourself or with others who have been through crisis? Have you seen any of that kind of progression? Yeah. Do you want to like unpack that a bit more for us? So what, what what are you referring to? Oh, divorce. Okay, you're talking about your divorce. Okay. The adjustment. I think people expect you to adjust too quick. Like, oh, that's over now. Get on with it. Sort of. well, not everybody, but certainly some people do. I'm trying to help you. I mean, I didn't take you know, a lot of them. I took it well. They're just trying to help with good intentions, but it really doesn't help. So, so how long do you think, could you put a, a time on it, you went through that uh, confused withdrawal before you began to adjust to that new reality? So, about a year. About a year? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Now what, what sort of things, what's, looking back on it, what sort of things um, uh, may have shortened that period? Or was, was the period of a year kind of... Uh, uh, was it a necessary length of time, or was it made longer because of people's failures, failures around you? Mm, well, it was a year, to eighteen months. Um, no, I didn't have a lot of support out where I was, so that might my like church support and, and good friends that sort of actually. You know, so, if I had that, it might have been a bit. Sort of got my head around a little bit sooner. I think. I still would have been about a year, I think. Okay. 
e even with good support, it might still have taken a year. Yeah, it wasn't help because sort of after a year, she wanted to come back, but it was just it turned out not to be genuine. It was for other reasons, so that kind of didn't help. Oh, that might have prolonged it. Yeah. Okay, you kind of plunged you back into it again, and yeah. right. Yeah. Nothing very straightforward about these things, is there? No. Um, incidentally, Michelle, uh, anything we talk about in here is confidential. Sure. And um, <coughs> Hans deletes anything off the recording that's of a personal confidential nature. So from time to time there'll be invitations to, to talk and put, put legs on some of the things we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Okay, well thank you. Thank you for that. What about what about you others? I realise with a with a small class, it's a bit hard, isn't it? <laughs> we can't we can't duck behind someone else. Perhaps being older because you have more chance to screw things up. Can <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I guess ask a question? Um, mm. When when is sort of a good time? when you would suggest to a person that's had a crisis that they should maybe you know, seek some help to, some counsel to... I'm just thinking that we've sort of made a friendship with an, an older lady who, if you have a moment with her, she sort of, and you get quite close to her, she'll just spend hours, just, she's got so much stuff that's in her past that right. hasn't been dealt with, which is... Oh, right. She's happy to talk about it, and right. but hasn't, and she has become a Christian later on in life. But, um, so, are we are we looking at something that's uh, chronic? There, it's kind of ongoing. Yeah, there's a, sort of anything that could happen seems to have happened to her. She's just had a really difficult life, okay. and become a Christian, and hasn't sort of, I guess, dealt with that, and from a Christian perspective, and understands how to deal with it. Right. So she seems keen to talk, but I don't know sort of where in that process would you say to the person look, you've obviously um, had, you know, had some, some crises and you need to be yes. at a deeper level yes. without offending them or stepping into it, you know, when they're over. Yes, yeah, it's a very good question, and it sounds like the lady you're talking about is somewhere at the adjustment or reconstruction is somewhere down there. Mm. And, and anywhere down there would be would be a very appropriate time to sit and look at what's happened in the past. Um, in the immediate impact, f followed by confused withdrawal, it's probably more just a, a maintaining non-anxious presence. Um, but it sounds like this person's at a point now where she's willing to talk about it. So it's just a matter of directing the conversation with some uh, uh, some questions designed to extend and extend the, uh, ask questions around the edge of what she's talking about and mm -hmm. give her the chance to explore it. Mm -hmm. um, I had a situation uh, once in my uh, pastoral ministry where I encountered um, uh, kind of a um, a loss of confidence by the session and me and my pastoral ministry, and that was that went over about a two-year period. Um, so that was uh, that was chronic to the extent that it wasn't a something that just happened, like a situation. It was something that went on for quite a period, or well, two years, in fact. And the and at the end of the two-year period, it was resolved when uh, I resigned and left the ministry. Uh, but that was certainly um, that that uh, confused withdrawal there, that paragraph there. That was something which I experienced for over a two-year period. That whole range of emotions, mm. and uh, it wasn't until after I'd actually resigned and left the situation that that adjustment was possible, could possibly begin to work. And it was at that point that I res started receiving counsel and and uh, and and reconstruction. But back then, it was uh, I was quite convinced, you know, that my my ministry was over. I'd have to go back to valuing houses. Yeah. I felt totally unfit and unqualified, and 
And uh, by God's grace, you see, he brought me through that process. I think you can also, I mean, you can have one crisis also comes before the other one's finished. And it kind of compounds it. Because, I mean, mine, it was two and two years or so. And I'm glad I stayed over, you know, I was overseas and didn't have a lot of support, but I had stable things and routines and that, which were, I think actually were good to have. But then I decided, now nah, for my own good and that, I need to come back here. And I ended up here studying here, which helped that in the crisis. But <laughs> the fact that I've been overseas for eight years and then came back, that actually took the 18 months to work through that, actually, because I didn't expect that at all. It really kind of surprised me that I really missed that whole, you know, just a type from going to be from a manager in charge of a lot of things to being a student with no one really to be in charge of and things like that. It was just so, it's actually pretty hard. So, yeah. so, so that was the adjustment, was it? The, uh, to a new reality? Well, part of it, yeah, I guess. Yeah. And was being here at GTC not that? Not that it's GTC, but being here at GTC, was that part of the reconstruction? Yeah, I guess. Can put it like that. Yeah, yeah. And you're still here. <laughs> <laughs> well, who knows how long the reconstruction needs to take. Well, I just want to say a few things over the page there about post-traumatic stress um, and this is a um, this is a condition which has been largely most of the research began after World War One uh, with um, with men coming back from the First World War who were in a, in a shell shock that's what they called it back then because it usually happened after the that endured these uh, barrages of, of um, guns going off for hour after hour after hour, both their guns going off and the enemy's guns coming upon them. So uh, it just eventually, many of them just uh, snapped in their minds. They just couldn't handle that, so hence shell shock. But, uh, and so a lot of the research began after that and now it's, um, it's uh, <coughs> been labelled post-traumatic stress and it's, it's the stress that happens after the incident has taken place. So we just, um, now, we, we usually think about post-traumatic stress as something which happens after something major has happened, like a war or, or what happened in, uh, in Japan with the tsunami and the earthquake. But in fact, uh, PTSD can, be, can actually be seen in people who go through all kinds of crises, large and small. So a post-traumatic stress reaction can give way to post-traumatic post stress disorder. So there's the initial reaction to the stress, which is what we've seen there, the immediate impact, followed by confused withdrawal. That would be the post-traumatic stress reaction to the incident. Uh, but then that can then give way to the uh, a post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, if the response to the crisis is prolonged beyond one month and is disrupted and disruptive and life-changing. So for instance, if, if the event happens and there's a reaction to that, and that reaction is prolonged beyond a month without, um, without moving on through to the adjustment and reconstruction and without help, uh, good counselling intervention and, 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 and any other kind of help, then uh, it's considered, you're considered to be in a post-traumatic stress disorder situation. You have a disorder you have a mental disorder and you're not coping, you haven't been able to recover. And I have an example here of childhood sexual abuse with accompanying disassociation, detachment and disconnectedness in adult life. Um, and uh, the reason I've used that example is because uh, uh, here in New Zealand um, we, we recognise that uh, those who in adult life are coping with the effects of childhood sexual abuse are suffering a post-traumatic stress disorder and hence 
are um, able and are qualified to receive um, help through ACC to get, uh, to get their counselling, their therapy paid for. Because ACC regards this as, a, as an accident, a sexual abuse in childhood was an accident, and this is the, uh, the downstream impact in adult life of that abuse. Hence, uh, it comes under their um, category of help because ACC is committed to helping people be restored to fullness and usefulness in adult living. So that's an example of post-traumatic stress disorder which is recognised and is quite a part of the counselling world. Um, and it's a, it's a medical diagnosis. But the reason we're talking about it here tonight is because you might know people who are suffering post-traumatic stress disorder who have never been diagnosed with it. But nevertheless, it's evident that uh, their adult life and their ability to function as an adult or even as a child has been severely compromised by something that happened in the past and they're kind of stuck there. They haven't been able to transition uh, through it to a place of um, adjustment. Um, so if you're, talking to, if you're talking to someone, for instance, an adult person who is, uh, uh, finds it very difficult to relate to people, very difficult to be open, uh, who is, uh, struggles with things like safety around people and um, uh, uh, kind of retreats and retreats from relationships. Uh, perhaps in marriage there's a, there's a retreating from uh, the sexual aspects of marriage. It's, it's quite possible that you're talking to someone who is suffering a post-traumatic stress disorder from childhood sexual abuse and they might be quite unaware of it. They might have no idea. Uh, they might think they're just, um, that this is normal or natural, the way they're behaving, or they may think that they're, they're going crazy, that there's something wrong with them. Uh, it just may be that um, they're suffering a PTSD without realising it. And uh, PTSD is a natural reaction to trauma. The seeker, the one who's coming to you for help, is not losing their mind. Uh, what, you see, what you may see is a re-experience of the crisis with triggered memories, nightmares and flashbacks. Uh, <clears throat> avoidance of any associations with the trauma. For instance, uh, they, they can't go down the street where they were mugged, for instance, those kind of avoidances. Um, or they can't go back to the town in which uh, the incident happened. Um, uh, often they, uh, they can't go back to the house if it was a, um, a sexual abuse as a child or maybe it was a domestic violence situation as a child or maybe a spouse in a domestic violence situation uh, even years after can't go back to the house or to the street or to the neighbourhood where it happened because it triggers or re-traumatises them. Their sleep problems, irritability, difficulty with concentration, easily startled, hypervigilance, and many more. The list is endless, really. So, you're, if you're talking to someone who's um, giving evidence of struggling with something that happened in the past, you're then faced with the um, the challenge of talking to them about something which they find deeply upsetting. And as you talk to them about it, and as you ask questions about the incident or the incidences that happened in the past, you see, uh, what you're doing, what, what your questions are doing uh, is taking them back there. Now, you see, they may not want to go back there, so they may not want to ask, answer your questions. But on the other hand, they may feel a desperate need to talk about it, and they may need a desperate need for someone uh, to step into that experience of their life with them because they're feeling very alone with it. That's why they're talking to you. So as you ask them questions, you see you're, you're taking them back and, and where they will possibly be re-traumatised again. Now why would you do that? Well one reason you might do that is because 
leaving them where they are hasn't worked. Here they are, you know, they they haven't been able to adjust and reorientate and uh, they haven't been able to become strengthened by the experience to the point where they can take the experience as a as a launching pad to re, to renew development and life and ministry. They kind of stuck. So you, where they are right now, obviously, isn't working for them. So that's one reason to take them back. Another reason to take them back and ask questions about the incident itself is because um, it, 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 and risk, risk the re-traumatizing, is because it, it gives them a chance to do what they never did at the time. To experience comfort in the midst of that, in the midst of that crisis, in the midst of that trauma. The fact that now they're talking to you about it afterwards in these anxious, in this anxious way shows that they have experienced no comfort in that trauma. Put it this way, a trauma comforted goes away. A trauma not comforted remains. So here you are, you're at the playground with your, with your children and, and your little boy's running around, as little boys do, and he falls over and he scrapes his knee and he sees his blood, he sees his blood and he, he comes running to his mother crying. And, and what does she do? She's a good mother, she picks him up, she gives him a big hug and she gets out her hanky and dabs the knee and he kind of, mm, it hurts, you know, as you dab the knee, and, and, but you're doing something, and, and, then, and then she holds on to him for about half a second, and he says, I'm okay now, and he struggles to get out of her arm because she wants, he wants to get down and play and run off and play again. You see, a, a, a trauma comforted is a trauma that goes away. It's gone. Now, what if he came to his mother and... and because he scraped his knee and she was sitting on the bench talking to a friend and this was the only time she had been able to talk to this friend in about three days of talking to babies and here she was in an adult, adult conversation and boy does this feel good and, and the child comes up with his bleeding knee and the mother doesn't want to leave off the adult conversation she tells the child to, to run away and play because I'm busy so the child goes away with his trauma uncomforted now it may sound like a little thing it may appear like a little thing at the time to the mother and, and the child goes away and he kind of sits by himself for a while and he kind of gathers himself together then he goes back to play perhaps he goes back to play a little more subdued than he was before but what's the mother teaching that child in doing that well she's teaching him a number of things one of them is uh, if you need comfort don't come and bother me um, another thing she's teaching them is you need comfort you have to comfort yourself you have to figure it out yourself. Um, that your pain is a discomfort to me. Now, while that particular trauma, the scraped knee, he gets over that, he heals that, but you see, as he grows up and he goes through life, he, grows, he, he goes into the traumas, the crises of transitions, both situational and, and transitional and... Uh, and what was the other one? Developmental. With the conviction, the understanding, the belief that whatever he encounters, he has to deal with it on his own because no one else is interested. No one else is going to comfort him. Now pretty soon he collapses under the weight of that. Uh, so... <coughs> You ask them questions about what happened, um, and you show an interest in what happened, and uh, and they, and and by taking them back there, you see, you together you walk back to that incident, and it can be quite upsetting for them, and they might even start crying, but now the difference is you are there with them, as they're re-traumatized, as they go back to that painful, upsetting situation, you are there to comfort them in it. When it happened, there was no one there to comfort them, no one there to understand, no one there to be kind and gentle and put an arm around them, no one to reassure them of God's good promises. But now you take them back so that you can give them the experience of being comforted in that trauma. And, uh, 
You see, uh, what a glorious thing that is. And now, and now when they think of that trauma, they think of you and your comfort. A comforted trauma goes away. Well, in their case, it might just kind of shrink down to something that's not so um, overpowering and paralyzing and, and debilitating and overwhelming. It may shrink down to a size which is more manageable, a size that they can adjust to. You've taken them back in order to give them the experience of being comforted in that trauma. Uh, this is what you do, for instance, if you're counselling an adult survivor of childhood sexual abuse. You, you uh, in, in, a, in a safe, very safe environment where there's a relationship of trust in place, you ask them questions about the details of what happened. Because you as the helper are there able to offer them comfort right in their time of need. As they go back to it, as all your questions, they're going back to it, and, and they're, they're, they're being um, taken back to the situation, taken back to the time of need, and you are right there to help them in their time of need. <laughs> now what does that remind you of? See? Hebrews 4. Let us then with boldness go to the throne of grace that we may receive help in time of need. Because you are now there with them in the trauma, not only are you providing them help and grace in time of need, but now you can take them and together you can go to the throne of grace and find help in their time of need, an experience which they never had when it happened historically. See, it brings a release. It brings a, um, uh, certainly a renewed hope. Um, has anyone here had experience personally or with people they know of post-traumatic stress disorder as a diagnosed, diagnosable condition? I would venture to suggest that our churches are full of people who are struggling to adjust to the reality of life in a fallen world without having had the intervention and comfort and grace of, of, um, of, of uh, loving care at the time that they needed it. And they've had to come through that without that experience of loving care and, and somewhere in there they've kind of stayed with the Christian life, they've stayed with church community involvement, but, but something in them has died. That, that now they don't really believe that all this community stuff we talk about in the Christian life really worked because it hasn't worked for them. Yes, they still believe in the gospel, they still believe that Jesus has forgiven their sins, and they still come to church because it's a community where they feel somewhat safe. But you see, it hasn't... It hasn't had a deep, abiding, life-changing effect on them at the time when they needed it the most. Now, we, if we have the opportunity, we can give them a, a taste of that experience of comfort and care at the time when they need it the most. But it's, uh, as, as Paul says, you know, death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. I mean, it's, there's a cost to all this, isn't there? A trauma comfort is a trauma that goes away. Imagine if, if our churches were full of people that had had the comfort of Christ through the lives of Christian people when they needed it at times of crisis. The love of God shared aboard in our hearts to people who desperately needed it at times of struggle. Now, 
Now, sometimes it's because we're not aware of the struggle because they're not talking about the struggles and they just, you know, they keep quiet and they just battle on on their own and, and they kind of come through it somehow by God's grace. But uh, some of the joy is gone, some of the hope is gone, some of the life is gone. And now they just appear to be going through the motions. Okay, well, why don't we take a break? <clears throat> the elderly neighbour has just been burgled. So it's a, it's, it's a trauma for the elderly neighbour. Now, uh, you know, I realise that these examples are kind of um, out of the ordinary of day-to-day -day living. Well, maybe they're not if you live in South Auckland. <laughs> All right for you guys in the sunny Waikato. Well, not that sunny, but in the Waikato. Foggy Waikato. <laughs> so some of these things apply to a, uh, um, a genuine crisis situation. Other, others of these things can apply really uh, to any situation where people are struggling to come to terms with, with the reality of their life, life as, as it's been for them. Let's just talk about it then in terms of the elderly neighbour who's just been burgled. Uh, ensure the safety of all involved. So. Uh, do whatever you need to do to reassure the neighbour that the burglar is not coming back. Uh, <laughs> well, you've say you've called the police. You know she's been burgled, and you've called the police, and uh, and you've shut the door. And uh, uh, if she's got children, you know the children are all accounted for. She doesn't have to worry about that. Uh, provide food and water, a cup of tea. Um, it is true that the British nation was built on cups of tea, and there's a reason for that. A cup of tea is a is a uh, stimulant, and it does make us feel better in stressful situations. It does help us get through. Inform family and friends. Uh, she may have people that you want. She wants you to call uh, and let them know what's happened. Mobilise support systems, you know, is there anyone that I can, uh, I can call? Is there anyone you want me to call that you would like to have here with you right now at this moment in time? It might be a family member, it might be a friend, it might be someone from church. Um, you might be a neighbour who, who uh, you know this person, but you know that you're not in their closest circle of confidants, so there may be some other people you'd like to have there in addition to yourself. There's nothing you can do or say to change what has happened. Um, life in a fallen world has crashed in on this person. They're experiencing what it means to live in a fallen world and there's nothing we can do about that except endure. Ask, ask her what happened uh, rather than how do you feel. Right now she's traumatised. People in a state of trauma are not able to talk about how they feel. Um, but they can talk about what happened. And, uh, and often they, they need to talk about what happened. They need to be able to talk through what happened so they can make sense of it. Well, I heard this crash and, and I came running into the room and uh, there was this person disappearing out the window and, and, uh, and I, just, I, just kind of, I just kind of froze. I didn't know what to do. And, 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 uh, and then they might tell, tell you that again a few minutes later. And, and, and they might add to it. Well, I was in the other room and I was, you know, making the bed. So you said they're adding to their story. And, and I came and I heard this crash and I came in. And, and, and so as they talk and as they put legs to their trauma, they're, they're um, making sense of it for themselves. Often in a trauma situation, you ask them what happens, you get a jumble of facts. Often that doesn't come out in chronological order. Um, well, I just, uh, you know, I saw this guy disappearing out the window. Well, before that, she heard a crash, you see, but that might come later in the story. Um, now, it sounds like in your situation, Michelle, you have someone who's, who's very keen to talk about what happened, at least in broad terms. And that's, that's really uh, uh, the starting point. Um, later down the track, when uh, they're at a, at a position where they're able to receive the benefit of your intervention, you can talk about uh, what's happened to them emotionally and, 
And that's important ultimately to get to that because it's when their emotions are activated by what happened that you can then provide comfort. Be patient while they tell and retell what happened. This is their way of making sense. Um, show interest, concern and acceptance. Thus treating, just treating them with dignity. What does a person usually feel who's been burgled? What's the first thing they usually feel? Disrespected. Disrespected. It's like a violation. Their, their, their home, their place where they feel safe and secure has dramatically, perhaps violently been invaded. And they're in shock and they feel violated. They no longer feel safe anywhere, not even in their own home. And uh, so they're, they're feeling um, helpless. Vulnerable. They're, sorry? Vulnerable. Yeah, feeling vulnerable, feeling helpless, feeling powerless, feeling like uh, perhaps like a small child would who's caught up in a, in a whole lot of events which they're powerless to control. And, and you see, as you, as you show interest, concern and acceptance, you're, you're treating them um, not, as the, not as the experience has reduced them to, but you're treating them as someone who is better than that. Someone with dignity, someone well bears the image of God, uh, someone with a spirit and a heart, someone within a strength which at that moment they don't feel that they have but you know it's there and you know it will come back sometime it will come back what they're feeling now in that initial shock is just temporary typical and temporary uh, normalize their reactions and perspectives how might you do that don't say oh you shouldn't say that or you shouldn't feel that way Oh, it's going to be all right. Or it's not that bad. Yeah, or it's not that bad. It could have been worse. It could have been. Other people are worse off. Oh, man. <laughs> man, terrible. I went to a workshop. This guy counseled people. Um, like he would fly, you know, if there was a hurricane or something in, in the right. situation. And he would say, you know, and he's talking with the people and trying to help them. He would say, like, you are having, you know, this is a normal response to an abnormal situation, like, letting them know this is, you know, really catastrophic, like, abnormal, but your response is, is normal or whatever, like, it's okay to be So what? People love to hear that, like, but it really seemed to comfort people to know that, you know, they weren't losing it, that it was normal. Okay. So it's, uh, you normalize it and you universalize it. This is a uh, this is a, a, a response to be expected at a time like this. So in this situation, then, how could you normalise perhaps this elderly neighbour's reaction and perspective? What kind of things might you say? Validating what she said, like, like, yeah, this really was awful. Like, that someone would, you know, do this to you, and just sort of validating her react feelings. And okay. Like yes, exactly. Uh, yes, Mrs. Brown, this is what's happened here is is, is dreadful. Mm. It's a shock. It, it should never have happened. It's a total violation. It's, and um, and the way you're feeling right now is is certainly the way I would feel in this situation and it's, it's, it's totally expected. It may be, you see, like a lot of elderly people who have probably lived all their lives fairly stoically, she's probably thinking, um, she's trying to, probably trying to pull herself together because you're there and you're the neighbour and she kind of knows you but not that well and, and she's a bit embarrassed about you seeing her in this distressed situation, she's trying to pull herself together, well, oh, I'll be alright and this is silly, silly for me to feel this way, and and you know we know it's a bad neighbourhood, and I'm sure other people are worse off. And mm. you see, she's she's trying to um, what? She's trying to do some self therapy here. Minimize. She's trying to minimise it, and she's saying to herself the very things that we ought not to say. 
If we're talking to her, now she's saying them to herself. Now, we don't want to get in a big fight with her about what she's saying, big <laughs> argument with her. But you know, you just at point, some point just slip in, well, this is, a, this is a really dreadful thing you've gone through. And I'm not surprised you're feeling upset. And it's okay for you to be upset. Normalize, um, universalize. Allow them to be honest about their feelings, fears, and reactions. Uh, and we've talked about that. Um, listen to them without, uh, and just accept whatever they say in terms of what they're feeling and uh, reactions, even if they condemn themselves for feeling that way. Um, allow them to be honest. Avoid describing their situation with labels and jargon. Oh, what you're going through now is, is a uh, post-traumatic stress reaction to what's happened here. And, and if you're not careful, you'll end up with a post-traumatic stress disorder. See, that's not going to be helpful. Now, you may know all that stuff, and, and you may be dealing with it and thinking, uh, you know, this is a, this is a post-traumatic stress reaction here this lady's having, but however, what she doesn't need from me is all that. What she needs from me is comfort and help. Encourage them back into their normal routines. Now, this might be kind of, might be an hour or so later, the police have been, and they've questioned her, and you've stayed there, and you've made her cups of tea, and now the police have gone, and um, uh, maybe some other people now are there with her, people that she knows, and, and um, so, you know, encourage them back into the normal routine. You could say to them, um, what, what needs to be done around the house here? What, what, uh, what normally would you be doing at this time of the day today? And she might say, well, you know, I'm expecting my husband home, or, or, or my son's coming back from school, you know, at three o'clock, and he usually has a snack. And, and so you'll say, well, um, rather than getting the snack for her, you might say, well, look, uh, uh, let's, let's, let's get the snack together for him. You show me where stuff is. Mm -hmm. So she gets up and she opens some cupboards, and, well, he likes these things, you see. And, and you see what you're doing? You're, you're encouraging them back in their normal into normal routines, but without abandoning them. So you're not taking over, you're not taking over their life, you know, or you just sit in the chair and drink your cup of tea and I'll take care of things. You see, that makes them feel what? Useless, Useless helpless. and helpless, and, and, and somehow it's a loss of dignity, I and mean, this is their home. So uh, on the other hand, you don't want to sit in the chair and say, no, you go off and do whatever you have to do because that's, you know, you, <laughs> you need to get back to normality, and I'll sit in the chair and drink the tea. Uh -huh. You see, you, you, you kind of uh, together. Um, ask if you can pray with them. Now, they, they may not be Christian, um, or they may be. Um, generally speaking, if you ask someone if you can pray with them, generally speaking, they won't say no in a situation like this. Uh, just, just be careful that you're not asking that question for your sake. Well, I'm a Christian, and, and I, should, I should pray with this person. Here's a great opportunity, you know, here's a great opportunity there to get a word in, a word of testimony or whatever. And, and, and so, so you might walk away and feel bad that you didn't pray with them. So don't, don't pray with them for your sake. I mean, if, if that's an issue for you, well, then you deal with that at the appropriate time and place. But right now, you see, your concern is for this person. And, and you may just get a sense of the fact that, well, this is, she, she's just not uh, in a good place right now for me to pray for her. She may misunderstand that. Um, and certainly be careful about asking them to pray. Uh, you may have a situation where you've got someone who's quite a strong and mature Christian, they may want to pray. They want to, may want to immediately turn this over to the Lord. You know, they may be quite exercised about the fact that right now is when we need to tell the Lord about what's going on here. Well, just go with that. Uh, wrestle with them as they voice their questions. How could a loving or powerful God allow this to happen? Um, there's no easy answers to that one. Uh, however, we, uh, someone in the situation, they have to ask that question. They have to ask it, and they have to be heard asking it, but they don't have to get an answer. Don't feel compelled to come up with an answer to that question. Uh, there, was, uh, there was a guy who's, who was... Um, 
who that I knew well, and his wife had a steady job. She was quite a, she was a professional person. She had a steady job, full-time job. They had teenage children, and he had he didn't have too many qualifications, and he was kind of a get odd jobs here and there. And you know things worked quite well. His wife was very happy to be working in her profession. And then right out of the blue, she got a very, very serious diagnosis of cancer. And uh, she would have been a woman in her early 50s, I guess, teenage children. And, um, and for a while there, it looked like it was going to be terminal. It was an unusual sort of cancer, and it was advancing rapidly in her body. And, and so they intervened with very, very dramatic and powerful medical interventions with her. So she went through this period of, of chemotherapy where she was just kind of absolutely laid out, you know, for weeks. Couldn't go to work, couldn't do anything, and, and uh, he really thought she was going to die. Well, she slowly recovered, and, uh, um, and today she's back to full health, and she's back working full-time in her job, and he's back to doing odd jobs, and kids are growing up, and, it's, and, and uh, you know, they're still in church. But whenever I see him, he still says to me, I can't understand why God let that happen. Why did God let that happen? You know, we were going to church, we were <laughs> doing all the right things. Why did God let that happen? Why did he bring all that into our family? Well, I can't give him an answer. Mainly, first, I don't know. And if I did it, you wouldn't be able to accept it. <laughs> I can't give him an answer. But I can let him ask, ask that question. So every time he asks that question, I kind of... I'm kind of making an effort to stop what I'm doing and, and hear him out again and say, well, you know, let's call him Fred. Well, Fred, it's a, you know, it, that's a, that was a very difficult time for you and your wife and your family. That was a very, very difficult time. And, you know, not many, not many Christians are called on to go through a time as difficult as that, but God called on you to go through that time. And, and, uh, and by God's grace, you've come through it. But as to an answer to your question, um, I'm not sure I can give you one. So he goes away shaking his head like, you know, why did God do that? Well, it's an emotional question, not really an intellectual one. Yeah, it is. So even if you give them a they don't want that. sound That's right. answer, they won't accept it. Right. They have to get there themselves. I could give him my best 30 minute sermon on suffering, a biblical view of suffering. <laughs> Would it make a scary good difference? Even though it might be a brilliant sermon, would make a scary good difference to him, because you're quite right. Emotionally, he's he's bound up in this question. Now, uh, you know, a lot of Christians do come through these kind of traumas with questions like that, and they do come to a point of being able to be at peace again with God, and they write books about it, don't they? About mm -hmm. you know, Journey Erickson and others, and so there is the testimony of Christians who come to terms with it and no longer gets in the way. So. With my friend, you see, I just, uh, I, I, my confidence is that God will ultimately bring him through where, to the point where he and his wife can rejoice in God's blessings and mercies in their life. Mm. Psalm 73, a soul in crisis. Do you like a Bible, Mark? I do have a Bible. It's my fault. Sorry, okay. I don't want to embarrass you or show you up, but you're okay? All right. Too late. Too late. <laughs> <laughs> Psalm 73. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold, for I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from the burdens common to man. They are not plagued by human ills. Therefore pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence. From their callous hearts comes iniquity. The evil conceits of their minds know no limits. They scoff and speak with malice. In their arrogance they threaten oppression. Their mouths lay claim to heaven and their tongues take possession of the earth. Therefore their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. They say, 
How can God know? Does the Most High have knowledge? This is what the wicked are like. Always carefree, they increase in wealth. Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure. In vain I have washed my hands in innocence. All day long I have been plagued, I have been punished every morning. In vain I have tried to live this Christian life. It's all been for nothing. Because here I am... Uh, <clears throat> Verse 2, my foot had almost slipped, I'd nearly lost my foothold. Now, see, there's my friend whose wife was very sick. You know, we lived a good Christian life, and look what God has done. And, and look, at these, look at these people that don't go to church. Their wives don't get cancer. Well, some of them do, but not the ones he's thinking about. If I had said I will speak thus, I would have betrayed your children. When I tried to understand all this, it was oppressive to me till I entered the sanctuary of God and understood their final destiny. Surely you place them on slippery ground, you cast them down to ruin, how suddenly they are destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. As a dream when one awakes, so when you arise, O Lord, you will despise them as fantasies. When my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you. Yet I am always with you, and you hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you, and earth has nothing I desire beside you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Those who are far from you will perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all your deeds. Verse 26. My flesh and my heart may fail. I may go through a severe trauma. And crisis, and my flesh and my heart may fail. Now, here's a man who went through a tough time, and he had a crisis of faith in the midst of that trauma. He saw how the wicked were sailing along without too much problem, and he had this wrestling with God in his heart, but like my friend with the wife who got sick. And, and now the psalmist has come to a point where he sees it a whole different perspective. He sees the end of the wicked, he sees the goodness of God, and he sees his own security and safety in the hands of a loving God. He's no longer asking the question, uh, <clears throat> how could a loving and all-powerful God allow this to happen? Now, ultimately, you see, Psalm 73 would be a paradigm of everyone we encounter who goes through a trauma and goes through that process that we talked about earlier. And, and is asking those questions. We would like everyone to go through the Psalm 73 experience and get to where they are at the end of Psalm 73. SF is at the end of Psalm 73. But it's probably not going to happen in the time it takes to read that psalm. See, part of the difficulty with those kind of psalms is we read them, and in the time it takes us to read them, three minutes. So it took me three minutes to read that psalm. We go from here, the psalmist goes from here to here, and we get to the end of the psalm and we're still down here. It hasn't worked for us in the three minutes it's taken to read the psalm. And the impression is that the psalmist went from here to here in the three minutes it took me to read it, or perhaps the ten minutes it took him to write it. But what we have there in Psalm 73, and a lot of the psalms, what we have is in compressed and abbreviated form a summary of a lifetime of experience. So as Asaph looked back on his life with God, Psalm 73 was a little bit of a, a picture window which gave us a sampling of what life is like to walk with God. So it might have taken him 5, 10, 20, 25 years to get to the point where he could write a psalm like that. Now that can be a much more encouraging way to think of the psalms. You know, we... we um, see, often we try to... Uh, with ourselves, we'll take the psalms and we'll use them like a, uh, like, like a Panadol. You know, maybe in half an hour the psalm will kick in and I'll feel better. You see? And, and then we, we try to use that with other people. Here, you know, so elderly neighbour's been burgled, so she's a believer. Let's sit down and read Psalm 73 together. You know, at the end of Psalm 73, you're saying, isn't this great? And she's still traumatised by the burglary. Mm. So if we, if we think of the psalm as being um, a keyhole glimpse of a lifetime of experience, then we can take comfort from a psalm like Psalm 23. And our comfort is, by God's grace, the day will come when I can write a psalm like Psalm 73 to describe my life. So here's a, here's a good thing to do sometime. You've got to spare half hour. Sit down and write out a psalm. A psalm that summarises your life experience with God to date. 
all the good and all the bad and where he's brought you and things he's taught you. But like Asaph did. So now when you're talking to someone who's going through a crisis, you won't use the Psalms like that. You won't use the Psalms the way, because your own personal experience has been not to use the Psalms that way. Like What's that? if you could get through that in six or ten weeks of counselling, someone you'd be doing really well, wouldn't you? If you could take a person. Oh, take them through that process. Yeah, yeah. That'd be awesome. So you wish them next week to get this and that. That's right. That's the mood. Now remember, see, last semester we looked at the counselling process, and uh, we saw that in fact, over a series of conversations. Six, say six weekly one hour conversations, you can actually bring a person to a point where, uh, by God's grace, they're, they're, um, they're, they're not where they were at the beginning. They may not be right at the end of uh, Psalm 73, but they're certainly moving through that and, and beginning, to, beginning to see renewed hope and, and renewed convictions and um, new beliefs. Uh, first time I found it, you know, sort of you know, six or eight months in, I guess, and I didn't like it, but I thought I get went back and read it over months because it was honest. That's how I felt. Like I wasn't happy, you know. I was like looking around at people I knew that were doing really well, happily married, heathen and all that. happily married. Well, no, they weren't happily married, but they're making heaps of money and just didn't care. Oh, okay. I mean, yeah, it was just. Yeah, so it was very real, but you know, as time went on, and you saw, you know, things in their life, you go, well, you know, I'm actually glad I'm locked in my head, you know, and yeah, we come through it, but it takes you know, a good six months, a month. That's a really good sign. And if you want a, um, if you want a, uh, a realistic, really realistic psalm, Psalm 88. Uh, psalm 88 is very similar. Um, a psalm of the sons of Korah, and Asaph was one of the sons of Korah, so you know it's the same kind of genre. And uh, I won't read all of it, but you see how it begins, O Lord my God who saves me, day and night I cry out to you before you. May my prayer come before you, turn your ear to my cry, for my soul is full of trouble, my life draw nears the, nears, uh, near to the grave. And um, uh, verse 15, From my youth I've been afflicted and close to death. I've suffered your terrors and, and am in despair. Your wrath has swept over me. Your terrors have destroyed me. All day long they surround me like a flood. They've completely engulfed me. You have taken my companions and loved ones from me. And darkness is my closest friend. Full stop. Well, I thought the, I thought the psalm was supposed to start down here and end up here. Psalm 88 starts down here and ends down here. Well, that's the reality for a lot of people. That they, that's where they stay. That chronic experience of trauma or crisis in their lives when the, when the roof caves in. And uh, so I'm very grateful for Psalm 88. It's, it, it helps me to be patient with those who haven't swung out and up. So uh, it could be, you know, that the person who wrote Psalm 88, we didn't get the second half of the psalm, he might have written this at one point in his life, and, and maybe six years later he wrote the rest of the psalm, but we just don't have it. And uh, So, you know, if you were to sit down and write a psalm that would summarize your life to date with Christ, it, it might be a bit like Psalm 88, it might be like Psalm 73. Either way, it's, it's your psalm, it's your testimony, it's your reflections on your life with God. And... and uh, and then you, you, you might put it away in the drawer and draw it out in six months' time and you might add to it. Or you might pull it out in, uh, in a couple of years' time and, and, and double the length of it as you talk more about what's been going on, going on in your life. The tough times and the good times, if there are any. It's just, it's just been real. Uh, <clears throat> what about Hebrews 11? Biblical characters in crisis. Uh, 
Hebrews 11, um, verse 35, about halfway through verse 35. Others were tortured and refused to be released so they might gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging, while still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. <clears throat> now that's people going through crisis. Those are people enduring life in a fallen world. They were going through crisis. And uh, um, 39, they were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Now those last two verses in that chapter suggest to us that these, these people that endured these dreadful things, they endured through to death and uh, never experienced um, relief or release from their pain or from their circumstance. Um, yet they uh, endured in their faith to the very end and, and, and now they together with us are perfected into something better. So it almost sounds like we too identify with what they went through and, we, and so they too will identify with us in the glory that we have with Christ. So there's the end goal. So here you're talking to this person who's going through a crisis. And, and you have in your own mind the way forward that eventually, eventually you would like this person to get to the point of, uh, of in Hebrews 11 or in Psalm 73 where they're able to look back after, after their, a time of adjustment and a time of rebuilding or adjusting to their new reality to be able to look back and say, well, you know, God, um, God really taught me some things. We have, a, um, we have a student here at the college, um, Rob Allen, whose wife has got multiple sclerosis and been a wheelchair for many, many years. And he, w he gave a public testimony here recently, and he said that um, the work that God has done in his wife's life and his life has been so wonderful that uh, they have much reason to thank God for, their, for uh, his wife's MS. In fact, she said to him recently, um, if I was to live my life over again, I'd ask God to give me MS because of what he's done for me. And he said, in this testimony, he said, um, he said, um, uh, knowing what I know now, if my wife had had MS before I met her, I would have still married her. Knowing what I know now about how the Lord has used that in our lives, and that's, you know, as you can imagine, that's a chronic situation like we talked about earlier. It's a chronic ongoing thing, and you know, we all know she's not going to get any better. Um, but the, uh, there is something better, 1140. God has planned something better for them both and for all of us. Now, it's, you know, it was a very, very compelling testimony. Very, very compelling. Uh, but the reality is, not everyone who goes through a crisis actually gets to that point. Um, it's taken them a long time to get there, of course. But as, as we, this is our confidence that, that, the, that Christ in our lives and the power of the Holy Spirit is real and he does bring us through and he does bring us to a better place. Um, you know how Psalm 23 begins with green pastures and quiet waters with the shepherd leading us and then the shepherd leads us into a valley of dark shadows and, and there in the valley of dark shadows <laughs> we're thinking... What kind of a shepherd is this? We had green meadows, how come? And we're saying to the shepherd, take me back to the green meadows and quiet waters. Why have you got me here in this valley of dark shadows? And uh, his answer is, well, the valley of dark shadows is the only way to the Father's house. I have something better in mind for you than green meadows and quiet waters. How about the Father's house with his joy forevermore? Well, the Valley of Dark Shadows is the only way to get there. Isn't that wonderful?
See, that's, that's ultimately where it all comes out, where PTSD comes out. And so with that confidence, you see, in our hearts, we can take the risk of stepping into the lives and to the hearts and the situations of people who struggle. We can take with fear and trembling, we can step into their lives, trusting that God will hold us together, he won't let us fall, and he'll hold them together. And together, by God's grace, we can be an encouragement to each other. If ongoing counselling is possible, counsel them through the reaction stages, bearing in mind that when our dignity as image bearers is offended, we must all learn to live in a fallen world with grace and hope, while trusting, groaning, and longing for that day when all wrongs will be made right. Uh, Romans 8. Uh, Romans 8.18 For I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. So Paul starts out by talking about our sufferings and then in verse 19 he goes to creation suffering. See how he goes from our suffering to creation suffering? The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed for the creation was subjected to frustration not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in the hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. So we, along with creation, are subject to frustration and suffering, and we, along with creation, will be brought to a place of newness and wholeness and glorious freedom. Now, if that's the case, then... Post-traumatic stress disorder should be the norm for all of us. All of us have been tossed out of the Garden of Eden. All of us are in a world that's groaning. And so creation groans and we groan. Verse 22. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in pains of childbirth up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly. So 22, the whole of creation groans. 23, Christians groan. Christians, who have the first fruits of the Spirit. We're not, uh, we're not uh, exempt from this groaning. We're qu being Christians doesn't separate us from the groaning that creation and, and the whole of mankind is caught up in. But the difference is in verse 22, in our groaning, we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons and daughters, the redemption of our bodies. From this hope we were saved. But what hope that is seen, uh, hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. So we, as we groan, we wait eagerly and we wait patiently. We're eager in our groaning and we're patient in our groaning. Now my friend with a sick wife, he wasn't there yet. He wasn't eager and patient in his groaning. He was resentful about his groaning. In verse 26, in the same way the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses, and he intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. So creation is groaning, humanity is groaning, Christians are groaning, and the Holy Spirit is groaning. What a mess. <laughs> what a mess. Everyone's groaning, including the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's groaning with, words that, with groans that we cannot express. In other words, you know, there's that elderly neighbour that's just been burgled and the Holy Spirit is groaning on her behalf. The Holy Spirit is groaning her groans at the throne of grace. The Holy Spirit is taking her groans to the throne of grace and groaning on her behalf. He groans on our behalf all the time. We may think that at times no one hears our groaning, that we groan silently, alone, we don't tell anyone, for whatever reason, and sometimes we forget, no, we're not groaning alone. The Holy Spirit groans with us. Woe to him who groans alone. Glory to him who groans with the Holy Spirit echoing those groans. And because the Holy Spirit echoes those groans, we can groan patiently and eagerly as we await. So, welcome to the groaning community. May you groan with joy and rejoicing. May you groan with eagerness and patience. May you groan in the company of others. Woe to him who groans alone.
Okay? Any comments you'd like to make about dealing with someone who's going through a trauma? Both either current trauma or struggling with an historical trauma? you do open the door they just they'll never stop talking um painful sort of stuff and probably if they write it down they would move past it because they, they talk it out but then they forget it or they can't see what they did or but i think the writing it is really powerful it kind of helped me when i i used to do poetry way back when i was a kid but <coughs> School didn't like my poetry, so I gave up. And uh, but yeah, I kind of actually went back to through that, just because I had a lot of time on my hands and didn't feel like doing anything. I was depressed, so then I started playing around with it and yeah, kind of painful poems for a while. But you actually look back now, you can see the progression going up. I think that was a real um, good thing. If I hadn't done that. It's very good. People express themselves in many different ways mm. through speaking, through writing, through drawing, through acting out, mm. many different ways. I was talking to a woman once a few years ago and and she was having a great deal of difficulty talking. Um, and I couldn't figure out whether she had this difficulty with everyone all the time or whether it was just because she was in a counselling situation. So I asked her if she'd like to draw what it is that she's trying to say and she came back the next week with these most magnificent drawings. Turns out she had a real gift in art, artwork. And uh, then she was able to talk about her drawings and she was very articulate. It was wonderful. And you know, if someone who is able, good with words, can write, that's fine. But maybe, maybe you're talking to someone who's really not much, not much good with writing. And what you could do is, is write out their story for them as they tell it to you, mm. and uh, then give it to them. Say, well, you know, have a look through this. Have I, have I understood it? Have I got it? Have I missed anything out? Have I misrepresented anything? And and so you're encouraging them to take ownership of that story and make it theirs. You're just the scribe. That can be a very helpful way for them to be able to uh, talk about something and then move on to the next thing rather than keeping come back all the time. Which I think is what you're referring to. You go over and over the same thing. You know, there's reasons why people talk a lot. Um, not always easy to understand. Sometimes people feel that if they stop talking, they'll uh, they'll disappear. They'll disappear from view, and no one will see them and no one will uh, connect with them. They'll just kind of evaporate. You've got to keep talking in order to, to ensure people stay engaged with them and they, can, and they can feel like they're engaged with life. Another reason people talk a lot, and you'll find this particularly on Sunday morning with people who live on their own, older people or single people who live on their own, um, they really had no one to talk to all week. They come to church, here's their one chance to get their week's quota of words out. Mm. And, and, uh, and if you show any kind of an interest in being any kind of a listener, zing, cha ching, you know, you've made their day, they've won the lottery. And, and so they've got to get their week's quota out because, because, you know, when they walk out that door and go back home with another week without talking to anyone, no significant conversations. So see how important it is for them to be able to have that conversation, how important it is that we don't give them the, the push off. Because we've got lots of people in our lives that we can talk to, but they don't.
Okay? Crisis and transition. We live in a world that groans. Well, I'll pray and then uh, I'll leave you with burger. Let's pray. Father God, as we have canvassed some of these ideas tonight, it's, uh, you have stirred our own hearts to recall something of our own life experience of walking with you. and You've also brought to mind uh, others in our lives who, who struggle just day to day with the reality of life. And, and sometimes, Father, we feel helpless. Sometimes we feel unequipped. We feel uh, helpless and then we feel underused. And, and uh, we, we, we have um, deficits in our own lives where others have failed to move towards us at times and we desperately need it, the involvement of others, a kind word, an encouraging word. And, and then, Father, we think about the times which we've failed that with other people and we certainly are a groaning community and we, we have to confess, Lord, that sometimes we add to that weight of groaning ourselves. And, uh, but, Lord, we thank you that you've placed us in the body of Christ and that you've filled us with your spirit and you've, you've, you've given us a community where we can be unified in love with one another in, uh, the, in, the, in the commonality we have in the gospel and of being joined with Jesus Christ forever and ever. And, and we pray, Father, that, that out of that common binding and foundation we have in Jesus Christ, that you would... Help us to build an effective ministry of encouragement in the lives of others. We pray you would make us instruments in your hands uh, as you work out your purposes of sanctification and redemption in the lives of others. And we pray, Father, in all of that, that you would do work in our own lives and, and that we too would be open to receive that ministry from others, however well or otherwise they, they seek to have it in our lives. And, and thank you for the opportunities that are in abundance all around us. And, we thank you, Father, that we can spend this time looking into your scriptures and reflecting together and musing together and, and, and above all, seeking wisdom from above to understand our own hearts and wisdom to understand the hearts of others so we can draw each other to the throne of grace in time of need. We thank you, Father, and pray that you'd do this in our lives and, and you'd help us to do this with the ones that we love that you've given us to spend our lives with and that there might be great encouragements and glory to your holy name in our midst. We ask for Christ's sake. Amen. Thanks, guys.